divine IT. So what are we going to look at? Well, we're going to look how information is used just generally amongst ourselves and in the world around us. Uh, we're going to look at a bit more in detail, what is the nature of information? Because that's important as we come to look at the, the word of God. We're going to look at DNA very briefly. Disclaimer, I'm not a scientist, so any scientist in the room, please bear with me. Um, but it's going to be a simplified um, ex explanation of, of how I see DNA. Uh, I want to look at briefly modern sign and the evolution of life and how information is dealt uh, from that aspect. Uh, and again, modern sign, particularly on how information is used uh, in our modern, modern world. And then at the end, we look at divine IT, God's use of information technology. Oxford Dictionary defines information technology, um, as you see on the screen. It's the study or use of systems. I've highlighted system because it's not just a random um, process information technology. It's a system that uses computers, telecommunications, etc., for storing, retrieving, and sending information. And towards the end, we look at how God uses that in the Bible. But we're going to have a bit of a preamble to find out, you know, to establish some principles on uh, information technology. So, how is it communicated? Well, there's different forms, isn't there? Could be the spoken word we got this evening. Could be the printed word. Could be the video. Could be a PowerPoint we've got behind us. Uh, but it's also information is transmitted biologically, which is when we come to the DNA aspect. So many, many different forms. And we're just going to bring some um, forms of information and transmission that we've perhaps seen, and probably not taken uh, too much information in. As we're looking at it, it comes naturally to us. But if we were standing 4,000 years ago and we saw these, these things, these hieroglyphics, we would think, well, what on earth is this all about? Well, it was, wasn't until many centuries later that uh, with the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, there was an English physicist and a Frenchman. But together, they unlocked the keys to understanding the hieroglyphics. And what we think in our day and age as well, information is a very new thing, you know, and it's very specialised. But this specialised information, it's been in the, in the tombs of the pyramids for thousands of years. And it, it was clear information for those that understood the code. And that's the point I want to make there. For those that understand the code, that understand the information. So what about in our more modern times? Well, communication was by the Morse code. Um, you might be familiar with that. If you're on a ship and you had no signals, then there'd be semaphore by the use of flags to communicate between land and shore or other, uh, other vessels. Again, another form of communication. Getting closer to home, signals on a railway line. And then you might have come on the road this morning and you've got, or this evening even, and you've got traffic signals. All information being produced, which we absorb and we understand in different, different ways, don't we? But then we come to computers, which for most of us is a bit of a mystery, isn't it? But it uses a binary code, as symbols of zero and one. In a combination, we get everything we can see. The laptop before you're here, it's all working on this code and it works most of the time very well. Um, but nonetheless, it's just another form of information. It's electronic code that produces something which we can digest. So what about the information process? Well, let's, let's just summarize it. We've got the person that is sending some information to us, right? Uh, it might be an author of a book. He writes a book or she. Hopefully it'll be sold and the receiver will, will read the book. Now, that presupposes two things. One, that the code that the, that the, that the author is using, either the language, so if it's English language, the receiver would have to understand what that code is. So they get it delivered, comes through from Amazon, say, gets in. Oh, it's not an English translation, it's Swahili. That's not much good to the receiver. So you've got to understand the code that's been, that's been written. So in this case, the code will be English language. And for the receiver to receive it, they would have to understand the same code, the English language. So that should be fairly straightforward. What about the Bible then? Well, if you think about the sender, in this case, it's God, isn't it? We've got God's, what we believe is God's written word here. Who's it for? Who's the receiver? Everybody, everybody on the planet is given the opportunity to read the Bible. It's translated into hundreds of languages and it's all around the world. So it's been sent from God and we've all received it. Whether we read it or not, that's a different story. But this is, this is the key. God's got a code and the code that he uses, he uses simple language in the Bible, poetry, prophecy, symbology, numerology, many other types of, of styles, and that's the code that God uses. A big book, but with many different styles. So for the receiver to receive it, they need to understand 
what God is trying to, to explain to us here. Now, if we come to the Bible with our own understanding and our own idea of what the Bible is, then we won't get the message properly because God's written it in a certain way, in a certain style, and it's up to us, the hearers, to understand that code or style. If we don't do that, then we find we get many critics of the Bible. So it's full of contradictions. It doesn't tie up. Why have we got four different gospels all saying different things? They're saying the same thing, but in a different style. So it's important that we understand the code, if you like, that, that God's using. And we do that just by reading it and comparing scripture with, with scripture. So that's the information process. So what about then the nature of information? Well, is it just a series of, of letters randomly arranged to form information, to form a sentence? Is that information? Well, you could read that behind me and it wouldn't make an awful lot of sense. But you could probably recognise the characters. It's from the English alphabet, isn't it? The Roman style alphabet. All the letters are there, but it's not information, is it? It's just a series of characters. Well, what about if we rearranged it slightly differently? Well, you could probably get some idea there that some words perhaps forming together, but it's not really intelligible is it, as it currently stands. So that's not information. What about these then? Now we've got, we've got some words formed by the same characters. We can get some idea of what's been said there, but it doesn't really make a sentence. So really, it's not really true information coming from a sender to a receiver to understand the message. But if we were to change it around just a little bit, we find there that information is always systematically arranged. And we can see that, can't we? Because the first line is not information, neither the, the preceding two. But the last line there, that is information. It's got the same characters, but they're not random. They're put in a certain style, in a certain format, that the message could be read and understood. And that's, that's important for us to understand. So there's one common denominator in all of this, and that's an intelligent source, isn't it? We've, we saw all the different, different uh, coding systems, traffic lights, railway signals, Morse code. There's always an intelligent source that is generating some information and it's always an intelligent resort, uh, source that understands it. So there's nothing random, it's, it's always by an intelligent source. And this is a universal constant. Wherever you are around the world, no matter what language you speak, if the Bible's in your, in your language, you can read it and you can understand it with a bit of help. And wherever we are, we know that to be true by our own experience. As some have called it the law of information. You can have characters, you can have symbols, unless it's organized in an organized manner, which you can understand it, then it's not information. So where's this leading us to? Well, with the discovery of DNA by uh, Crick and Watson back in, back in the mid last century, they discovered this wonderful substance or this, this uh, form of, of uh, systems and organization of information, what they call DNA. I won't try to pronounce it, you can read it. But um, as I say, it's a self-replicating material which is present in everything around us. We all contain it, and it's part of our chromosomes that make us male and female. And importantly, it carries information. And it's that information we just want to look at very briefly. When we break down the cell, we see it's not simple at all. There's a lot of information there, this double helix, as you can see there, or there. It's absolutely compact with information. And information has to be something that's ordered, that can be understood. Understood by what? Well, we'll come to that. So I just want to pick up on particularly one thing. DNA cons information to make amino acids. Well, what do amino acids do? Well, when you get 20 of them together in a string, ordered, we get proteins. And proteins we've heard of, haven't we? We eat food with protein. Protein's important because it, it builds up our muscles, it transports substances through our body, it's protective if we get uh, some ailments, then the proteins help to, to protect us and, and many of the many of the things that I'm sure that those who have got more background than I could, could help us with. But the point is, it's information. And perhaps the most important point, it's got information that is stored and is passed on for future generations. And that's, that's important for us to know. And we'll look at that when we look at the scriptures a bit later. So the DNA is just another code system. I say just a code system. It is a fantastic piece of information, isn't it? And technology there. And it's not simple, is it? But what's, what's even more amazing is that to unpack this information, there's machines in our body called enzymes. 
and they split this helix, you can see there by the, by the strand there. It's got all the code there. This machine reads it, copies it, closes it all back up together again so it's there for future generations when we, when we passed on through, through creation. Um, then it exits the nucleus. And then that goes throughout the body, many machines building proteins, muscle, everything with the information that it's got. And we get all these 20 chains come together. But that's not the end of it. These proteins, they aren't just strung along end to end. These proteins are then folded into a 3D model that forms certain shapes. Without these shapes, it can't find the right part in the body to go to. Because in different parts of the body, there's a different address, if you like, and a certain shape. So unless you've got the certain shape, the proteins won't find its way to the right part of the body. So what we're seeing is that it's not just information, it's actually information to build things. And not just in 2D, but in 3D. In fact, it's even better than that, because think of baby in the womb, it grows, doesn't it, in a certain order. So we've got times involved as well. So we're looking at 4D now, 3D for the shape, but you've got to go out into the right time throughout the body at certain times to build, build a human. And that's pretty complex, isn't it? And it's pretty amazing. And we've said information only comes from an intelligent source. And I think we could see that this couldn't happen by chance because it's very specific what is required. Our DNA sequence there, it's called a genome. There's an estimate that there's 3 billion DNA bases in our genome, in our body. That's a lot of information, isn't it? In fact, a DVD has three gigabytes, and that's probably not even anywhere near touching what's, what's in this DNA that we're looking at. We say that if it's unwound and tied together, all the string of information, then one cell would stretch almost six feet, but it would only be 50 trillions of an inch wide. Very tiny amount, very compact. And some scientists worked out if you unraveled it all, it would stretch the moon back 6,000 times. That's just in our own bodies. It's absolutely phenomenal, isn't it? The amount of the way it's compact. So let's, let's look at evolution of life then. When I was at school many years ago, it was taught that evolution, the life came back through evolution, the uh, procedures and all that. But when I started to read the Bible and that and looked into the science behind evolution, I, I looked at the scriptures and I thought, well, it's not a book of science because that's, that's not where it's supposed to be. But when I look at Genesis 1, and we'll, we'll look at that in a moment, we can see that there's a pattern developing here. When I looked at DNA with the information there, uh, I thought there's a lot, of, a lot of similarity there, and it's not by chance. So when we look at evolution, evolution, it's all about matter and energy. We've got physical, chemical properties, things come together by physical attraction or reaction. So it just kind of happens, there's an attraction there. But that's not what we've seen, is it? So evolution process would say, well, it's a random chance process. It takes a long time, given enough time, all these parts can collide together, come to such a point that we get the DNA that will, that will, that will either form life or continue life. And it's all a matter of chance and physical attraction. So how do we go from molecules to man, from fish to birds? To the, well, it's just by mutations. It's by natural selection. So that is, that, is one, that is one understanding of how it may have come about. But we haven't been seeing that when we've looked briefly at information, have we? Many scientists actually now do not follow and do not, uh, do not believe in the evolution model for evolution of life. They discount it. Why is that? Because they see it's not random what, what's been happening when they look at our bodies and the DNA and how it works in the machines and all the intricacy that it's very specific what's going on. It's not random at all. A long time, it's been calculated by mathematicians that actually, to get the level of complexity, the earth hasn't been around. You know, most people that don't believe in scriptures will think about three and a half billion years or even longer. Scientists have proved that actually, when you crunch the numbers, there's not enough time that we're on the earth so far that would actually allow anything like the complexity. So that's been discounted as well. We've seen it's not just random chance that these symbol, the, these, um, these processes happen. It's a manufacturing process. This is another level of complexity. It's not by attraction of chemicals or particles together. This is an actual manufacturing process that we see in the DNA. 
What about mutations to form different lives? Well, mutations destroy information. And we've seen early on the slide that you can have all the random symbols there, letters, it doesn't make any information. When you get a proper sentence, it makes sense. But you can imagine if that proper sentence was then jumbled up again, which is what really mutations are, then you lose the information. So you don't get better, you get worse things. You don't get a progression of, of man, you'll actually get a regression. So mutations is a destruction of information, which we've seen is, is really destroy the argument of uh, evolution by, by uh, purely random means. And scientists generally talk about energy and matter of being the fundamental particles, but actually information is required, as we've seen with the DNA particularly. And information, it doesn't, it's not attracted to anything, it's built in, it's an intelligence that's built in, and that's what require, is required for life. And that information has to be there from the beginning. And we notice the order in Genesis that, that the environment was created for man, and then man came about. There's an order in creation, and there's an order in information. If we looked at just random processes, we wouldn't see that order. We'd see rather destruction, wouldn't we? So the information's got to be there from the start. A bird's got to be a bird. A fish has got to be a fish for everything to work in order. And a man's got to be a man. So that's led to many scientists that are non-religious to conclude that actually, when they look at these things, they see intelligent design. They don't believe, particularly in the Bible, but they believe and they can see this intelligent design. We would encourage anybody to go a little bit further and actually say, there's an intelligent design by an intelligent designer. So where did the information come from then? Well, we read, didn't we, in the beginning? And we're gonna go there now, if you would. So Genesis chapter one. In the beginning, God created the heavens of the earth. And as I said earlier, many people looked at the Bible and said, well, it's very simplistic, isn't it? You know, it's very simplistic. How can we possibly, look at science, look at the things we discovered in DNA. Why do you wanna read the Bible? And I just say, well, if you're gonna write a book that's gonna last for thousands of years for everybody to read, how many could understand a book that was full of formulas and chemical equations? The answer would be none. What about all those people, millions of years ago, thousands of years ago rather, millennia is what I'm trying to say, um, they couldn't understand it until now, and we look at DNA, the Bible will be hidden from them. So the Bible is not a book of science. It tells about God, and it's just a historical account. So that would be my explanation if you think, well, the Bible is very simplistic, but it's not. Did you notice the expression as we read through in Genesis chapter one? Everything was created after his kind, whose seed is in itself. Now what we've seen with the DNA, that's exactly consistent what God's done. He's created the information contained in the chromosomes, in the DNA, that will form everything that we see around us. It's not a book of science. But we can see, can't we, how God is explaining very complex things that's simple for everybody else to know. And we can see, don't we? You plant a tree, a fruit tree, it gets fruit, it flowers, it seeds, and so on. So it's something that we know. But look at the DNA that goes into all the fruit trees. If you looked at that, it's, it is incredible. But the message going all the way through this chapter, and I've just highlighted them in, in yellow, after his kind, whose seed is in itself. All the way through in yellow. And when God repeats something, particularly, we're asked to note these things. And right in the very beginning, he's telling us that I've created it, created it with perfect order, the information's there, and now science, the wonders of science, we can see how amazing that is that, that God's done. And it just keeps going. Everything has got that information, whether it's birds in the air, fish, whales in the sea, Mankind, it's all made in the same manner. Now we don't find species and we don't find all the, all the, 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 uh, the terms that, that scientists have used, but we find when we look at the Hebrew, we find it's just after its sort. Everything is different. A similar process, but it's all different. It's not going from one thing to another. In the creation that God's created, it's all separate. All different entity, for the perfectly good reason, that for man to live, he needs water, he needs air, he needs oxygen, he needs food. It's got to be in an order, hasn't it? It can't just suddenly develop out of nothing and then suddenly man, man appears or any other living thing. There is a synergy, isn't it, between everything that we look at. 
But that's the important bit there, isn't it? Each having the ability to replicate. And we've seen how the DNA works. It's copied, but it's put, put back together carefully so that the human species, animal species, fish species, they can keep on replicating. A fish still becomes a fish, becomes a fish. A cow becomes a cat. It's still the same thing after its own kind. And that's exactly what, what the Bible is telling us here. It keeps on repeating itself. And what about man? Well, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And that's the difference, isn't it? We've got all the animal creation, the animal kingdom and everything else on it, but man is made differently. The animals can't receive the information from the Bible, but humans are designed to understand information. So we are quite unique, aren't we? Animals have their own information. They communicate together very well. Humans don't communicate so well, as we've seen. But nonetheless, the level of information that, that mankind can, can take is vastly different. So much so that Bill Gates, the, who was the founder of Microsoft, he said this, he said, human DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software ever created. Our friend Richard Dawkins in one of his books, River Out of Eden, says that the machine code of the genes is uncannily computer-like. Apart from differences in jargon, the pages of Molecular Biology Journal might be interchanged with those of a computer engineering journal. Interesting, isn't it? That the DNA and computers and all the information technology is remarkably similar. Why would that be? Well, it's no coincidence because man is made in the image of likeness of God. He thinks the same way that God did, not on the same level, clearly. So when God creates something, when we come to do computers, Bill Gates said it's remarkably similar. It's far more detailed in the DNA than what we see now, but the computers and the information that's in that is very similar. And even Dawkins recognized that, that it really this process of information, it is, is un uncanny like computer process. Now, if you ever put up your computer and you get an error, you get the blue screen of death, don't you? What's happened there? Well, that information has been corrupted. So information needs to be in an orderly fashion. It doesn't need to be corrupted. That's why we say that, that mutations in information cannot produce anything from something to nothing. It can't do that because the information is broken down. So what does the Bible say about information? Well, one of the prophets, Daniel, he was given this information. He said, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. And I think we'd all agree that knowledge has absolutely increased exponentially in the past 20, 30 years. So what's the point of that? Well, what, what Daniel's been told is that there's gonna time when the kingdom of God will be established. And the time will be when knowledge has greatly increased. And it's always been increasing, but I think we'd probably agree that in this last 20, 30 years, it's increased exponentially, as I said. So that leads us to the conclusion that Paul brings us in Romans 1, chapter 19. Got all the, uh, the quotes on the screen for you. Read these words with what we know about DNA in, in our own bodies, and we've seen, and scientists have shown that it is, it is remarkable, the amount of information that's in there and the organisation of it. So the Apostle Paul says, that which is known about God is evident within them. And we've seen in DNA, haven't we, that the amount of information that even Bill Gates has realized that this is, this is phenomenal. So we've got the evidence now that Paul in his day never had that. But it's evident within us if we look at it, evolution does not answer the question of how we come to be where we are and how specialized we are. So God says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen by being understood through what he has made so that they are without excuse. And that's where I found myself when I started looking at the scriptures and believing evolution. I thought I'm without excuse because this didn't answer the question, whereas the Bible, it answers the questions. And particularly when we look at DNA, it, it really is. It really is a game changer in that sense. And it was for me. So in conclusion then, we've looked at quite a bit this evening. Well, divine IT information technology, it's been built in from the beginning. We see it in DNA and we see it even amongst ourselves, how we communicate to each other. 
And that's just another witness to God. You put that together with prophecy, we touched on Daniel very briefly, but from this platform, many prophecies have come to pass, particularly with Israel being in the land. It's all leading to the kingdom of God coming upon the earth. The nation of Israel, as we said, is a massive witness. Every day on our newspapers, whether you agree with Israel's stance or not, they are God's witness. And there will be a judgment against them, being no doubt we're not the political organisation. But God says Israel is a witness. And we've all seen it. We've all been a witness to that. Archaeology, the discoveries that you're finding, again, just confirm exactly what the Bible uh, claims to be. A book about God and a historical count. In fact, many archaeologists look to the Bible first before they go looking into uh, any study that they may have. Numerology, we can look at that. The consistency of the scripture from the beginning to end is a marvel in itself, written by many authors over different times. There is an absolute consistency there. And there's a moral code, which you would think, if you believe in evolution, survival of the fittest, why would you have a moral code? But there is a moral code, and people do stick to that. You might say, I don't believe in the Bible, I've got a moral code. I would just say, you made in the image and likeness of God, that's why you've got a moral code. So finally then, a quote there from Isaiah. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He established it, he created it not in vain. He informed it to be inhabited, formed it rather. I am the Lord and there is none else. The earth will not be destroyed by mankind, by a nuclear holocaust. God's got a plan and a purpose. You might say, well, there's chaos at the minute. God has given mankind free will to do what he will to a point. But there is a day that God's promised when Christ will return to establish his kingdom. And we encourage you to look at that.